Chapter 11 of The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Forest Men Attack. Many times during the months I remained prisoner among the Hans, I had tried to develop a plan of escape, but could conceive of nothing which seemed to have any reasonable chance of success. While I was allowed almost complete freedom within the confines of the city, and sometimes was permitted to visit even the military outposts and disintegrator ray batteries in the surrounding mountains. I was never without a guard of at least five men under the command of an officer. These men were picked soldiers, and they were armed with powerful, though short-range, disintegrator ray pistols, capable of annihilating anything within a hundred feet. Their vigilance never relaxed. The officer on duty kept constantly at my side, or a couple of paces behind me, while certain of the others were under strict orders never to approach within my reach, nor to get more than forty feet away from me. The thought occurred to me once to seize the officer at my side and use him as a shield, until I found that the guard were under orders to destroy both of us in such a case. So in this fashion I roamed the city corridors, wherever I wished, I visited the great factories at the bottom of the shafts that led to the base of the mountain, where, unattended by any mechanics, great turbines whirred and moaned, giant pistons plunged back and forth, and immense systems of chemical vats, piping and converters, automatically performed their functions with the assistance of no human hand, but under the minute television inspection of many perfumed dandies reclining at their ease before viewplates in their apartment offices in the city that clung to the mountain peak far above. There were just two restrictions on my freedom of movement. I was allowed nowhere near the power broadcasting station on the peak, nor the complement of it, which was buried three miles below the base of the mountain, and I was never allowed to approach within a hundred feet of any disintegrator ray machine when I visited the military outposts in the surrounding mountains. I first noticed the escape tunnels one day when I had descended to the lowest level of all, the location of the electronic plant, where machines known as reverse disintegrators, fed with earth and crushed rock by automatic conveyors, subjected this material to the disintegrator ray, held the released electrons captive within their magnetic fields, and slowly refashioned them into supplies of metals and other desired elements. My attention was attracted to the tunnels by the unusual fact that men were busily entering and leaving them, Almost the entire repair force seemed to be concentrated here. Stocky, muscular men they were, with the same modified oriental countenances as the rest of the Hans, but with a certain ruggedness about them that was lacking in the rest of the indolent population. They sweated as they labored over the construction of magnetic cars evidently designed to travel down these tunnels, automatically laying pipelines for ventilation and temperature control. The tunnels themselves appeared to have been driven with disintegrator rays, which could bore rapidly through the solid rock, forming glassy, iridescent walls as they bored, and involving no problem of debris removal. I asked San Lan about it the next time I saw him, for the officer of my guard would give me no information. The supreme ruler of the Hans smiled mockingly. There is no reason why you should not know their purpose, he said, for you will never be able to stop our use of them. These tunnels constitute the road to a new Han era. Your forest men have turned our cities into traps, but they have not trapped our minds and our powers over nature. We are masters still, masters of the world and of the forest men. You have revolutionized the tactics of warfare with your explosive rockets and your strategy of fighting from concealed positions miles away where we cannot find you with our beams. You have driven our ships from the air and you may destroy our cities, but we shall be gone. Down these tunnels we shall depart to our new cities, deep underground and scattered far and wide through the mountains. They are nearly completed now. You will never blast us out of these, even with your most powerful explosives, because they will be more difficult for you to find than it is for us to locate a forest gunner somewhere beneath his leafy screen of miles of trees, and because they will be too far underground. But, I objected, 
Man cannot live and flourish like a mole continually removed from the light of the day without the health-giving rays of the sun which man needs. No, Sanlon jeered. Wild tribesmen might not be able to, but we are a civilization. We shall make our own sunlight to order in the bowels of the earth. If necessary, we can manufacture our air synthetically, not the germ-laden air of nature, but absolutely pure air. Our underground cities will be heated or refrigerated artificially, as conditions may require. Why should we not live underground if we desire? We produce all our needs synthetically. Nor will you be able to locate our cities with electronic indicators. You see, Rogers, I know what is in your mind. Our scientists have planned carefully. All our machinery and processes will be shielded so that no electronic disturbances shall exist at the surface. And then, from our underground cities, we will emerge at leisure to wage merciless war on your wild men of the forest, until we have at last done what our forefathers should have done, exterminated them to the last beast. He thrust his jeering face close to mine. Have you any answer to that? he demanded. My impulse was to plant my fist in his face, for I could think of no other answer. But I controlled myself, and even forced a hearty laugh, to irritate him. It is a fine plan, I admitted, but you will not have time to carry it through. Long before you can complete your new cities, you will have been destroyed. They will be completed within the week, he replied triumphantly. We have not been asleep, and our mechanical and scientific resources make us masters of time as well as the earth. You shall see. Naturally, I was worried. I would have given much if I could have passed this information on to our chiefs. But two days later, a mighty exultation arose within me, when from far to the east, and also to the south, there came the rolling and continuous thunder of rocket fire. I was in my own apartment at the time. The Han captain of my guard was with me as usual, and two guards stood just within the door. The others were in the corridor outside. And as soon as I heard it, I questioned my jailer with a look. He nodded assent, and I did what probably every disengaged person in Lotan did at the same moment, tuned in on the local broadcast of the military headquarters view and control room. It was as though the side wall of my apartment had dissolved, and we looked into a large room or office which had no walls or ceiling, these being replaced by the interior surface of a hemisphere, which was in fact a vast viewplate on which those in the room could see in every direction. Some two hundred staff officers had their desks in this room. Each desk was equipped with a system of small viewplates of its own, and each officer was responsible for a given directional section of the map, and busied himself with teleprojectoscope examination of it, quite independently of the general view thrown on the dome plate. At a raised circular desk in the center, which was composed entirely of viewplates, sat the executive marshal, scanning the hemisphere, calling occasionally for telescopic views of one section or another on his desk plates, and noting the little pale green signal lights that flashed up as sector observers called for his attention. Members of strategy board, base commanders of military units, and San Lan himself, I understood, sat at similar desks in their private offices, on which all these views were duplicated, and in constant verbal and visual communication with one another and with the executive marshal. The particular view which appeared on my own wall fortunately showed the east side of the dome viewplate, and in one corner of my picture appeared the executive marshal himself. Although I was getting a viewplate picture of a viewplate picture, I could see the broad, rugged valley to the east plainly, and the relatively low ridge beyond, which must have been some thirty miles away. It was beyond this, evidently far beyond it, that the scene of the action was located, for nothing showed on the plate but a misty haze permeated by indefinite and continuous pulsations of light, and against which the low mountain ridge stood out in bold relief. Somewhere on the floor of the observation room, of course, was a sector observer who was looking beyond that ridge, probably through a projectoscope station in the second or third circle, located perhaps on that ridge or beyond it. At the very moment I was wishing for his facilities, the executive marshal leaned over to a microphone 
and gave an order in a low tone. The hemispherical view dissolved, and another took its place from the third circle, and the view was now that which would have been seen by a man standing on the low distant ridge. There was another broad valley, a wide and deep canyon, in fact, and beyond this still another ridge, the outlines of which were already beginning to fade into the on-creeping haze of the barrage. The flashes of the great detonating rockets were momentarily becoming more vivid. That's the Gokman Ridge, mused the Han officer beside me in the apartment. And the forest men must be more than fifty miles beyond that. How do you figure that? I asked curiously. Because obviously they have not penetrated our scout lines. See that line of observers nearest the dome itself. They're all busy with their desk plates. They're in communication with the scout line. The scout line broadcast is still in operation. It looks as though the line is still unpierced, but the tribesmen rockets are sailing over and falling this side of it. All through the night, the barrage continued. At times it seemed to creep closer and then recede again. Finally it withdrew, pulling back to the American lines, to alternately advance and recede. At last I went to sleep. The Han officer seemed to be a relatively good-natured fellow, for one of his race, and he promised to awake me if anything further of interest took place. He didn't, though. When I awoke in the morning, he gave me a brief outline of what had happened. It was pieced together from his own observations and the public news broadcast. End of chapter 11